Dear colleagues, welcome to, to today's ESC webinar on how to diagnose <coughs> enteritis syncope in 2019. I am Professor Michele Brignole from uh, Ospedale del Tiguglio, Lavagna, Italy, and I have uh, the pleasure to be, of being joined by Professor Gonzalo Baron Esquivias from Hospital Universitari Vinger del Rocio, Sevilla, Spain, and Professor Daniel Steven from Art Center, uh, University Hospital, Cologne, Germany. The aim uh, of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of the diagnostic and therapeutic algorithms of the 2018 ESC guideline on syncope through clinical case presentation. This session is uh, interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in online assign, uh, assessment session in the form of multiple choice questions that will be submitted during the presentation. I will now hand over to Professor Baron Esquivias for the presentation of the first case. Hello. My case is uh, a, a very young female woman with a recurrent syncope and I try to present what is the rational diagnostic approach. Syncope guidelines try to, to cover all patients with syncope, but uh, sometimes recurrent syncopal episodes appear in a patient as well. And sometimes guidelines suggest the solution, but not exactly <coughs> what to do. <coughs> These are mass dis those are mass disclosures. Well, you can see in that screen, that is uh, uh, the screen of my computer in the hospital, how this is a 31-year-old lady that uh, from 2000, 1997 sorry, until last February of 2019 have been admitted in three different hospitals of my community around of 10 times. Her history began in, 2000, in 1997 when she was 99 years old. Because recurrent syncope, she was admitted in the cardiology, pediatric cardiology department of another hospital of my community. The reason for the hospital admission was recurrent love of concealedness. In the history, we can read that she always referred typical vasovagal problems. But also, after the episodes began, she also presented mandibular trismus, ocular diversion, and scissors that sometimes make that the uh, physician doubt about the etiology of such syncopal episodes. Moreover, the patients sometimes present a sphincter relaxation. In that uh, uh, hospital admission, uh, the patient was studied under blood analysis, chest X-ray, halted ECG, echocardiography, and also based in the neurological symptoms, she was studied under cranial CT and also with electroencephalogram. She was discharged from the hospital with the diagnosis of vasovagal syncope. After that, 15 years old later, when she was 25 years old, she was once more admitted in a hospital in the cardiology department because recurrent syncope. She was one more studied with blood analysis, checks X-ray, cranial CT, abdominal CT, and abdominal echography, and based in the symptoms that she referred previously to the symptom, to the syncope, that was abdominal pain, she was surgically, and uh, uh, the, the physician decided to perform a surgical anexectomy because that abdominal pain. 
After that, in 2016, she was once more admitted in the cardiology department because recurrent episodes of syncope. And once more, the physician repeat the, the, the echocardiography, the stress test, and also carotid sinus massage that all, was also negative. And the, the diagnostic at the end of the study was once more vasovagal syncope. And no treatment was recommended at all. Moreover, those uh, hospital admissions, this patient attended the emergency room department in several times. I referred you four of them. The first one, 2010, she was, uh, she visited the emergency room because a right radio bone fracture after a syncope. In the same year, some days later, second emergency room because recurrent syncope. Seven years later, third emergency room visit because recurrent syncope, but also moreover carot cardio cardiac hospital admission in cardio department and also in emergency room department, she had been visited by neurological neurologist. Uh, in 2007, the first time she was attended by neurology department in another hospital of my community, she was a student because the symptoms that she referred during the episodes with cranial MRI and also with e electroencephalogram. And they decided to put on treatment with lamotrigine because they thought that epilepsy was the etiology of such episodes. After that, four months later, she was once more attended because the syncope, the syncopal episodes recur after that treatment. And once more, they decide that the etiology of the, of the symptoms was epilepsy, and they changed the treatment from lamotrigin to levitracetam. Nevertheless, this change in the treatment, the patients continues with new syncopal recurrences. As you can see how they, uh, she was once more studied with uh, EC, EAG with a sleep deprivation. And once more in the last summer of, 19, of 2018, she was uh, uh, on treatment with levitracetam because they decide that this was the best treatment Nevertheless, that patients continues with new episodes of syncope. May I stop you, Gonzalo, for a moment? Of course. Because uh, we have uh, a, a the first question from the webinar. A colleague uh, asked you, why an exetomy in a so young woman? Well, that is a good question. This is a, a, a very typical situation in patients with syncope because Patients with syncope sometimes are really clear, very clear, and you know what to do. But a recurrent episode in such patients presents some doubts in the emergency room departments. They wanted to eliminate the trigger, being, yeah. being able, unable to eliminate uh, the they disease. Do not, they didn't know how to avoid the syncopal episodes, and they tried to treat the pain that patients refer. But the pain that patients refer before the syncopal episodes are not based in an organic disease. Do you agree with the decision of performing an exetomy? Absolutely no. Absolutely not. This is... Uh, a conclusion. Daniel, do we agree <laughs> that you two agreed not to perform an exetomy? Yeah, absolutely. I think it just shows how helpless people were in the situation and how they did not know in such a young patient after yes. so many years of syncope what to do. And this was um, an extreme decision, I suppose. Exactly. After that, patient was sent to our department uh, a few uh, weeks ago. And we attend the patient and we perform a precisus, a clinical history. She referred syncopal episodes, as I told you, from 1996, always with vasovagal problems. The frequency of the episodes, more or less one to three by year. But sometimes she referred that there are 
by several episodes, including the same day, dial episodes. And curiously, during the last 12, 15 months, the patient referred some episodes that occur during the night. It is, her husband tell, told us how his wife, in the moment in the night, uh, uh, touch him and uh, say that she feel bad and that she feel some abdominal pain and some sweet and she lost the consciousness, she do a uh, deep snoring, she always uh, present uh, uh, some scissors, she always present mandibular trismus, ocular aversion and several times a sphincter relaxation during the episodes. After that episode, the patients recover completely and spontaneously, and they clean the room, clean the, the bed, and continue sleeping during the night. So the situation was extremely uh, clinical, for, uh, as you can see in the, in the case. So this is my first question, Mikel, for the audience. This was the patient. The patient was in our department, our cardiology department in my hospital. And the question is, what, or which test do you recommend? First answer is adenosine test, external lobe recorder, tilt test, implantable lobe recorder, or EP study. Please uh, vote uh, in the next few seconds. While you are waiting for the vote, I have to say that I have received a question from a colleague saying, why not uh, perform a tilt table testing before? The, the answer is that I don't know why they, not, they do not perform previously. I do not know. This is the case, the real case. And my, my personal feeling is that there are few hospitals in the public system that perform tilt table tests. It actually, the answer of the poll is very interesting because the table testing is suggested by 32% of the colleagues, but, not, but is not the majority because the majority, 47%, recommend an implantable loop recorder. So the question seems to be debated. This is uh, exactly the, 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 the possible answer that we can to do. What, what, do, what we decide was to follow the guideline recommendations you remember this, this picture, this figure, from the last guideline of syncope, 2018. And for people with recurrent syncopal episodes, guideline recommend to perform a carotid sinus massage that was performed in, in, that, in, that, in that patient with, with negative result. And after that, guidelines recommend to perform a tilt table test. Exactly the next step that the guideline recommend with a 2A level of uh, indication and B level of recommendation is to perform a tilt table test. So you just refer to the, to the guideline and the question is, um, this refers to patients older than 40 years of age, which makes complete sense. However, when I recall correctly, your patient was 31 years. Do you think you can, is it practical to just apply these guidelines which usually should apply to older patients to these younger patients as well or what was your rationale in this specific circumstances to do it like that? Uh, guidelines recommend to perform tilt table tests to all patients with recurrent syncope. No, the, the EH, the age no, is not uh, a limit for, to, for that decision. Guidelines recommend treatment for older than 40 years old but not diagnostic test. So in such case, with recurrent episodes of syncope, where there is some doubts between or among the, the theology of the, of the syncopal episodes, it is rational with a 2A level of indication to perform a T-table test. The question is debated among uh, the, the, webin the participants of the webinar, because uh, now I am receiving another, <coughs> another comment. He says, uh, Implantable loop record should, should have been implanted 10 years ago. So someone asked, uh, why not to table that? But both say, uh, comment that uh, too much time has been lost uh, doing useless tests, uh, forgetting the two most used tests, T-table tests and loop record.
But uh, uh, as you recognize, Mitchell, this is one of the most frequent uh, situations in syncopal per in people with syncope, because there are several patients that receive a huge number of diagnostic tests that are necessary tests before to perform a tilt table test or an implanted loop recorder. So this is a very frequent situation in my, in my clinical perspective. So we decided to, to perform a tilt table test. And you can see here, this is the, the result of the tilt table test. At a, a, approximately in the mm, seven minutes of the beginning of the table, you can see how the patient present an asystole. And after the asystole, patient present um, approximately 61 seconds of asystole. And of course, patient lost the consciousness. Of course, the, pa of course the patient present scissors. And of course, the patient present an sphincter relaxation in the, in the cabinet, in the laboratory test. So we reproduce what spontaneously the patient suffer as she recognized after patients recover. Once more, tilt table tests reproduce what patients refer in the spontaneous clinical episodes. And this is the utility of the tilt table test for the diagnostic approach in such patients. Uh, someone asked if, uh, why not, uh, why carotid cell massage was not performed if it is contraindicated uh, under the age of 40 years? No, carotid cell massage is not uh, contraindicated, and we performed her as I referred previously. Uh, probably I, I do not extreme, uh, extreme another, stress. Another participant is asking how long were lasting the spontaneous episode of loss of consciousness. And I like to put this question in view of the slide that you are showing now, was uh, the duration of loss of consciousness during tilt table testing similar to the duration of spontaneous episodes? Uh, exactly, the patient do not, did not refer as the, the duration of the, of the spontaneous syncopal episodes, but uh, her wife referred us that it was very long time probably because the nervous of the situation. But nevertheless, I think that we have, we have looked in the importance of the duration of the asystole, and there is no relationship between the duration of the asystole, of the pause, and the clinical situation of the patient. It is, you can look, you can find a people with low frequency of syncopal episodes with very long pauses and people with very frequent episodes with, with short pauses, and all of them with asystole. So the, the duration of the asystole is not in very important in the time and in the order to, to, to decide what to treat and how to treat the patient. Considering the symptoms, the neurologic appearing symptoms of this patient, is this related also to the pause, or is there an underlying neurological problem that we need to address further? Or do you think the explanation now, what we are seeing, is enough to also um, to also explain the neurological symptoms? Or this is a very interesting question. We are we have we have been looking in the duration of the systole and the evolution, the follow up of the patient, but never we have we have been never seen if, if there is a relation between the long the long of the pause and the symptoms that patient refer. But mm. my personal perspective, in my personal experience. When a patient suffer a long pause, more than 10 seconds, the patients present always uh, scissors, always, and after 10, 15 seconds, the patients frequently present a sphincter relaxation. Mm. So I, I, su I, su I suggest, I, I feel, I feel is that the, long, the longer the pause, the most clinical is the episode that patient is suffering. And after a patient presents an asystole in the tail table, I can say you absolutely sure that the patient feel worse. Mm. It is. Patient that suffer syncopal with a hypotensive answer, with hypotensive response, feel better before the episodes than patient that suffer an asystole. I don't know why we have been not uh, looking exactly the data, but this is my personal impression in the diary practice.
But these neurological overlapping symptoms may also be a good explanation why <coughs> implanting a loop recorder is also reasonable with a 2B indication in patients that have neurological symptoms but medication doesn't help. So there still might be long pauses that cause the, the symptoms. Absolutely. The, the, in, in this way, this is one of the recommendations of the, of the yeah. new guidelines. This is one of the new indications of ILR implantation. So it is very, uh, very important to remark this setting. When patient is that diagnosed of epilepsy and the patient continues with episodes, probably you must look for another address, another yeah. direction. And I think that ILR can help us to correctly diagnose those patients. So it's very interesting question. Agreed, yeah. uh, there is no doubt that uh, looking at the distal table testing, one minute pause is an extremely long period. And uh, someone could be also worried of, of potential consequences. But my question for both of you and for those in, in, in the webinar that would like to send uh, our opinion is this. Do you believe or not that uh, the patient could have had also during spontaneous episode an asystole of one minute duration? Because one minute duration in spontaneous syncope raises the question where to treat with a pacemaker, mm -hmm. even if uh, vasovagal syncope is benign in nature. In, in fact, the E3 three data of, the, of, of your paper, of your document, do not explain how long was all the poses. And, and excuse me if I interrupt, one attendee say, were the symptoms during the table test, the, the neurological symptoms during the table test is similar the same of the spontaneous? I have already asked this question. Exactly yes. the same, exactly yes. the same. Uh, so my question, to, my, my answer to your question is, uh, in my opinion, when a patient presents a very long pause of, or during the tilt table, I'm not afraid for the follow-up. I am afraid in the moment. And in this, in this patient, I, I perform uh, man, uh, maneuvers for, for animation. I uh, put uh, atropine in, in the vein, and also I put in the recovery room during all the morning. Mm. And after the end of the morning, I do not discharge the patient. But uh, knowing the follow-up, we have observed poses longer than 90 seconds in very young people, in very young people, with no problem at all in the follow-up. So the, 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 long of the, the length of the pose is not very important for the follow-up. The most important, in my opinion, is the recurrence the previous recurrence of the episodes. But I think the point is still well taken since you always wonder after a tilt test, is this really, and this is also where the, where the question points at, is this really the clinical scenario yeah. in which the patients I, get these I symptoms? am receiving a lot of So the question is always after, after a tilt testing, do you need further assessment to really make sure that this patient experiences the same symptoms and this underlying cause is the same as revealed in the tilt test? And this is, this is yes. something the question and when I points to. Three questions on the same uh, subject. They say, uh, uh, three, 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 do, three different uh, participants, but syncope spontaneous occurring occurring during night, supine. No, no, sometimes yeah. occurring during, during, during night, sometimes. No, no always, okay? No always. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, another says, uh, how can you say that uh, the mechanism of syncope was a dominant cardio inhibition and was not also an associated vasodepressor reflex that uh, uh, cannot be uh, shown. Uh, do you think that vasodepressor reflex is so important in front of an asystole of one minute? I think that the, the, the answer that we saw, that we see in the tilt table is not always the same. So the reproductivity of the tilt table answer is not too high. So we have several doubts in what to do when we see this response to a tilt table. This is the way, this is the reason, because today guidelines do not recommend with an A, 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 1A indication to implant a pacemaker after that. 
The, 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 the guidelines recommend with a 2B indication. Because nobody doubts that question, this is not a spontaneous episode. The, the, the question is clear. Does the positive tilt table test explain the syncope during night, yes or no? For me, in a patient older than 40 years old, of course, yes. Yes, the question is yes. Concur, another, another comment, it's, it's very intriguing, very intriguing in the, this tilt table test. Concur with the other participants. Patient syncope at night in light position, again, they, they stress this point. And how a tilt table testing can be able to replicate uh, syncope in a completely different stressor because the patient is lying on bed. Why a, a orthostatic stressor can replicate? Uh, so the, they raise the question of low specificity of the, uh, the tilt table test or response despite a very, very long uh, poses. The, 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 the question uh, is very interesting and the answer is I don't know because I but can't, it is so. but uh, in, uh, I can explain uh, absolutely sure that many patients with vasovagal episodes of syncope with null ducts present nocturnal episodes of syncope very frequently. So this is not the first case I saw. It is very frequent that patients with recurrent episodes of vasovagal syncope present syncopal and nocturnal episodes of syncope. So how the, the, the tilt test produce or induce a situation similar? No, no, I think this is not the way. The tilt table induce, and in, in a specific condition, a, re a, a response of vasovagal reaction. Not exactly the same that in the night, but I can tell you that it's very frequent to listen how those patients present nocturnal spontaneous episodes of vasovagal reaction. So you're, le you're left with the question whether based on this finding of the tilt testing, what do you do? Do you implant um, a cha dual chamber pacemaker in this patient? What is the, what is the next is, step uh, in the assessment? This is the most important, the most important issue. This is the, the, last, the next question I perform to the audience. What to do now? You can education and life still modification and physical Counter pressure maneuvers. You can recommend through the cortisone or mid ring. You can also implant a pacemaker, a DDD pacemaker, or you can perform another diagnostic test. So, this is the question for the audience. Just a few minutes that we are waiting <coughs> for, the an for the answer for the four results. Yeah, but I think correlation between the, the symptoms and what actually happens during what's happening, that, that is the, the key message here to, yeah. to see how to perform further with the patient. The vast majority vote for a pacemaker. The vast a majority. Chamber pacemaker, yes. Okay. No, no doubt. It's uh, 62%. Nevertheless, uh, our position is that once more, what patient are in, in, in this case are not covered by the umbrella of guidelines because the guidelines say nothing for a patient with 31 years old with recurrent episodes of syncope and a systole long pause. So what we did, we did exactly what you are doing or what you're looking here. We, can perf we, can imp we could implant a pacemaker, but we decide to implant an ILR. Why? because patient present syncope also in the night and the patient was 31 years old and the patient present several neurological symptoms. So there are several de data to decide not to implant a pacemaker with a 2B indication, but be better to um, try to show if the spontaneous episodes, the episodes that patients suffer is, a, is, a, is similar, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, this is, the discussion is very interesting, and I would like to continue, but unfortunately the time is running. Well, we implant an ILR, and curiously, the patient presents a deep syncopal episode with a sphincter relaxation and tonic-clonic seizures during the implantation of, of an ILR. And we saw the ECG that showed a prolonged systole during episodes. And this is, a new, a new 
debate between our group in the hospital. What to do? What decide? Well, we decide after this induced asystole to wait until the next spontaneous syncopus episode that patient pre will present. And today, one, more than, one month and a half after the implantation of the ILR, the patient is alive with no syncopal relapses, and we are waiting what to do when she presents a new syncopal episodes. So, we will see what happens.